Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. I am Dr. Niharana, FCVSD trainee dermatologist. On behalf of the dermatology department, Dr. Ruth K.M. Pau, Civil Hospital, Karachi, I welcome you all to the ninth Dermatology Clinical Pathological Conference, Karachi, and the second from our department. Today, we are here to share two very interesting clinical gray cases with you all to broaden the horizon of your knowledge. For each case, a question and answer session will be conducted. And finally, a vote of thanks by Dr. Humaira Talat. Before that, we would like to share a short video clip of our department's recent educational activities. A leprosy seminar was conducted in collaboration with Mary Adelaide Leprosy Center on 4th February, 2023. In this seminar, the maestros of the respected field shared the clinical knowledge and experience with the participants. Indeed, it was a great learning experience for us all. Moving forward, the first clinical gray case will be discussed by Dr. Aksa Azgar Ali under the supervision of FCBS consultant dermatologist Dr. Fari Nashwak. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Aksa, FCPS 220 at Department of Dermatology, Dr. Ruth K. M. Pau, Civil Hospital, Karachi, Dow University of Health Sciences. Today, I'll be sharing an interesting case with you all. This case is about a 15 months old baby girl, resident of Balochistan. She came to us through OPD on 17th of Feb, 2022. With presenting complaints of ulcerated lesion over face and fever since 1.5 months. According to her mother, baby was all right 1.5 months ago when she noticed an ulcerated lesion initially on her left cheek that started as a small raised pea-sized lesion, which then rapidly progressed in size. Similar type of ulcer also developed on the right cheek and tip of nose. Lesions were non-discharging. She also developed fever, which was low grade, occurring at night time, not associated with rigors and chills, and relieved after taking Panadol drops. There is no history of diarrhea, sore throat, rhinorrhea, ear discharge, insect bite, trauma, burn, or drug expo uh, exposure before the onset of lesion. She also denies history of atopy and similar lesions in the family. With these complaints, the patient was admitted in pediatric department initially where she was empirically started on IV antibiotics for two weeks, but the lesion did not improve. Her systemic review was unremarkable. Her past medical and surgical history was unremarkable except for her recent admission in pediatric department, which I already mentioned in history of presenting complaints. Regarding family history, no history of TB, any other chronic illness or similar complaints in the family, allergic history was not significant. She was born through normal vaginal delivery with a normal birth weight. No complications were reported in postnatal period. She achieved her developmental milestones according to her age. Regarding vaccination history, BCG and all vaccines were done according to EPS schedule. According to her mother, her appetite was greatly reduced since last two months. Currently, she is on mother feed with some semi-solid diet. Now, moving towards examination. On physical examination, she is a baby girl of average height and weight, looking irritable. At the time of presentation, she was widely stable. Regarding general physical examination, mild pillar with a mild pitting pedal edema was noted. However, rest of general physical examination, including lymph nodes, was unremarkable. Now the cutaneous examination. On examination of face, two well-defined necrotic tender plaques with irregular margins showing central crust formation and surrounding erythema were distributed on bilateral cheeks. The size of ulcer on the right cheek was four by three centimeter, 
the similar plaque of three by two centimeter present on left cheek. Some crusting and post-inflammatory hypopigmentation was appreciated on the tip of nose as well. Rest of her cutaneous examination was unremarkable. Her systemic examination, including cardiovascular examination, respiratory examination, abdominal examination, and central nervous system examination, all were unremarkable. To summarize my case, 15 months old baby girl resident of Balochistan presented with ulcerated lesion over her face associated with low grade fever since 1.5 months and a reduced appetite. She was admitted in pediatric department and was given IV antibiotic for two weeks with partial resolution. No family history of similar illness. On general physical examination, she was pale with mild pedal edema was appreciated. However, lymph nodes were non palpable. On cutaneous examination, there were two well-defined necrotic tender ulcerative plaques with central crust formation distributed over both cheeks. The size of ulcer over the right cheek was 4 by 3 cm and left cheek was 3 by 2 cm. Rest of her cutaneous and systemic examination was unremarkable. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Farheen Ashwa to come and discuss differential diagnosis. Thank you, Dr. Aksa. So keeping in view the short history of ulcerative lesion over a face of a young child with low grade fever and in the absence of systemic features, we initially thought of some infectious etiology that is leading to this ulcer. So cutaneous infections are quite common in this age group and they can be either superficial or deep. If you look at the case presentation, the lesion seemed to be deep. So we kept ichthyma ganglionosum as our topmost differential and the child was managed accordingly with the IV course of antibiotic. However, the lesions did not respond, and this made us suspicious if some other infectious etiology is underlying. So considering the high endemic area, cutaneous tuberculosis can present as a non-healing ulcer over the face, since head and neck is the commonest site in this age group. If you noticed in the history, the patient is also a resident of Balochistan, and the lesions are present over the exposed site. So yes, there is the possibility of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Other deeper infections like atypical microbacteria and deep mycosis, though less common in this age group, are also kept as initial differentials. Besides infectious etiology, we also thought of paniculitis and keeping in view the age of the child and the sites of predilection, cold paniculitis and lupus paniculitis were kept as differentials. Now, Dr. Aksa will proceed with the workup in order to rule out these differentials. Thank you, ma'am. So keeping in mind these differentials, we did following investigations. Her HP was low with 9.2 value of normocytic and normochromic uh, picture. TLC was raised of 15.6 with a mild, mildly raised ESR. Her urine DR was normal. Her renal function test, liver function test, and coagulation profile were within normal limits. Her viral markers, including hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HCV, and HIV serology, all were non-reactive. Blood culture at the time of presentation was negative. Her Montox test, skin smear for antibodies, serum ANA, all were negative. Imaging investigations, including chest X-ray and ultrasound abdomen, both were normal. So up till now, a negative blood culture with no antibodies on skin slit skin smear, negative Montox test with a normal chest X-ray and negative ANA. These investigations haven't revealed any underlying pathology, so we needed a skin biopsy to reach the diagnosis. We decided to go for her skin biopsy, which was performed on 17th of March, 2022. S samples were sent separately for histopathology as well as bacterial, fungal, and mycobacterial cultures. Her tissue cultures showed heavy growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Enterobacter species. They were treated according to their sensitivity with injection meropanum for 21 days after getting opinion from infectious disease department. While she was on IV antibiotic, we received her histopathology, which showed mild irregular acanthosis. Junction of dermis and subcutaneous area also showed vessel wall with fibrinous material and inflammatory infiltrate around the vessel wall and interstitium. Subcutaneous tissue showed expanded septa infiltrated by neutrophils, lymphocytes, and few histocytes. Septa showed occluded vascular walls with swollen endothelial cells, intraluminal fibrinous material, lymphoneutrophilic infiltrate in vessel wall, and extravasation of RBCs. No granuloma or focus of caseous necrosis was seen. So the findings were uh, revealed paniculitis with vasculitis suggestive of arrhythmia and duratum of basin. Her fungal cultures were negative. After two months 
after of the skin biopsy, we received her tissue culture for AFB, which came out to be positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis, which was sensitive towards the first line ATD. Here, I would like to mention that we are presenting the case in the same sequence as it is presented to us. So initially, we received the report of tissue culture that shows heavy growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Enterobacter species. And according to culture and sensitivity, the patient was again given IV course of antibiotic. During this course, we received histopathology report, and the features were suggestive of nodular vasculitis in favor of erythema induratum of basin. And then ultimately, we received tissue culture that show the growth of tuberculosis on the same tissue. So here arises the query, if, these, if this cutaneous ulcer is the manifestation of active TB in the skin, or is it the hypersensitivity reaction to some distant focus of the TB, which is the tuberculin? So if we talk about the tuberculin, that is erythema induratum of basin, the only uh, favorable point was just the histopathology. However, the site, the commonest site of erythema induratum of basin is the leg, and it usually predominantly affects the females obese. So, keeping in view the positive, uh, the negative Montauk's and positive TB culture, we reached to the final diagnosis of cutaneous tuberculosis co-infected with Pseudomonas and Enterobacter species, and the child was started with first line ATT. So, we started her on tablet Myron P4, 2 OD in split doses for first two months as an initiation phase. Afterwards, he was shifted to tablet Rufina, which is a combination of rifampicin and INH to OD in a split dose for four months as a continuation phase. After two months on ATT, she presented with a complete resolution of lesions with only residual scarring. But at the fifth month of ATT, she again developed scaly raised lesion over cheeks, nose, pin of ear, bilaterally associated with photosensitivity. And the photosensitivity was described by mother as whenever the baby goes in sunlight, she cries a lot. According to mother, the treatment compliance was adequate. In this picture, well demarcated arrhythmatous scaly plaques distributed over photo exposed site as shown by blue arrow interspersed between old discard lesion is shown by black arrow. So the story did not end here. And then this new eruption raises the query if this is the continuation of the same disease or is it something else? As we are dealing more often now with the resistant strains of tuberculosis, so we are worried if this young child has acquired these strains and this led to think of the treatment failure or relapse. Another question arises in our mind that if these lesions are a part of immune reconstitution in Primatry syndrome, which can present as paradoxical worsening. Besides that, ATT, especially isoniazid, is a culprit of various drug reactions. So we also kept it as our differential. In order to exclude all these mentioned differentials, we need a rebiopsy and to resend the tissue culture, especially to rule out the possibility of MDR and XDR TB. So let's see what it revealed. So after discussion, she was advised a repeat biopsy from the scaly margin of the lesion. And the skin biopsy for histopath showed focal epidermal atrophy with overlying hyperkeratosis, focal parakeratosis with follicular plugging, vessel layer showed vacuolar degeneration, occasional dyskeratotic keratinocytes seen in epidermis, papillary dermis revealed mild pigmentary incontinence, perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic infiltrate. There is also mucin deposition in dermis seen on periodic acid shift stain. No fungus was seen. Immunofluorescence was showing IgG deposition over dermoepidermal junction. So the findings were suggestive of discoid leucus arithmetosis. Keeping in mind her histopath, we advised ANA, which came out to be positive. However, anti dsd DNA, ENA profile, and anti stone antibodies were negative. Her repeat culture for mycobacterium tuberculosis came out to be negative. So here is the query again. Is this idiopathic ALE or drug-induced ALE? Before moving towards the diagnosis, let's discuss a few words about drug-induced ALE. It is uncommon, mild to moderately severe lupus-like condition related to continuous exposure to specific medications and after exposure to uh, uh, with healing of the lesion after the exposure to drug uh, is ceased. Like idiopathic ALE, it has three varieties, drug-induced SLE, drug-induced SCLE, and drug-induced CCLE. The incubation time ranges from one month to more than 10 years. 
Drug-induced CCL is rarest of all the three forms. It appears on average eight months after starting the trigger medication. Lesions resembling DLE have been the most common presentation. There is no any specific criteria, but a roughly proposed criteria for drug-induced ALE is at least one clinical symptom of ALE with time relationship to starting the drug, resolution when the drug is seized, and the immunological finding of CCLE comprises of an ANA positivity in around 66% of patients with antihistone is rarely detected, ENA, anti DSDNA is negative, and the blood cell counts are usually normal in patients of CCLE, drug induced CCLE. So, the points in favor of ATT induced ALE in our patients were the history of drug exposure, zero conversion, and initially negative ANA came out to be positive after exposure to ATT histopathology of the skin suggestive of disquiet ALE and the resolution of lesion after stopping the ATD. So this is the picture of our patient after stopping ATD. So we made a final diagnosis of INH-induced disquiet lupus arithmetosis. ATD was stopped after completing six months. We advised sun protection along with topical tacrolimus and a regular follow-up to this patient. Now the literature review. We are sharing this case from Nepal Journal of Dermatology of a drug-induced CCLE eight months after isoniazid therapy. The diagnosis was uh, based on clinical aspects, histopathology examination, along with direct immunofluorescence examination, the absence of systemic involvement, and the routine laboratory parameter, which registered all within normal range. Recently, in our department, we came across a similar case of dual infectious pathology where the tissue cultures showed growth of clapsilla, aspergillus flavors, and same tissue for histopathology showed caseating granulomas suggesting tuberculosis. So this was all from my side. Now, Dr. Farin will further conclude the case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aksa, for nicely presenting this case. Now, my dear colleagues and respected seniors, I would like to highlight the purpose of presenting this case in order to emphasize the atypical manifestation of the commonest disease in the region. Cutaneous tuberculosis in childhood can often be missed or overlooked due to its non-specific symptoms, and it can be a source of transmission to adults as well. If we look at our case, the initial presentation correlated with ichthyma ganglionosa, and accordingly, the patient was given the course of antibiotic twice. However, there was partial resolution, and this led to us further investigate, and we did not give give up. When patient was responding well to ATD, the eruption, the new eruption of scary plaques interspersed in the old head lesions raises the query if this is the case of treatment failure or relapse. However, the cultures turned out to be negative. And the zero conversion of ANA, along with the positive histopathology features of DLA, we made it, we concluded it as a case of INH-induced lupus erythematosis. So, my take-home message is, cutaneous tuberculosis is a great imitator. Misdiagnosis among clinicians is likely. One should always be suspicious whenever the common skin infections are not responding to the normal course of antibiotics, like in our case. <laughs> Histopathology may not be elucidative. Physicians must resort to every single test to make the diagnosis. Separate samples should always be collected for AV detection and culture in view, in view of emerging strains of MDR and XDR TB. So here I will conclude my case with this caption, think, test, and treat TB. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Farin and Dr. Aksa for sharing such a fascinating case. Now the second clinical case will be discussed by Dr. Sabah Faisal under the supervision of Dr. Humaira Talib. Assalamualaikum. I'm Dr. Sabah Faisal, postgraduate trainee in Department of Dermatology at Dr. Ruth Kim Fall Civil Hospital, Karachi. Today I would like to share a case of a 22-year-old female married, resident of North Karachi, housewife, who presented to Dermatology Outpatient Department, Civil Hospital, Karachi, on 29th of September 2022 with the complaints of multiple itchy scaly lesion on the body for the last two years, multiple non-healing ulcers on some mammary area along with proximal muscle weakness for the last two months. According to the patient, she was all right two years back when she developed multiple itchy and another mildly scaly lesion on the body at the time of birth of her first born daughter. These lesions were diagnosed as a case of tenia corporis infection. She was prescribed numerous treatments, including topical and oral antibiotics, um, antifungals, and topical steroids, but were unable to clear the infection completely. 
The most frequently used strain was a combination of beta metazone dipropionate 0.05 percent, clotrimazole 1 percent, and gentamicin 0.1 percent, along with other potent and superpotent steroids. She became pregnant again, and at the start of her second pregnancy, she was prescribed a course of oral steroids, delta cortin, starting from three tablets two times daily, but tapering at three days for a period of two weeks for the same scaly condition lesions. After starting oral steroids, she rapidly gained weight of around 10 kg in the last two months. She developed excessive facial hair growth and marked striae over her abdomen, upper and lower limbs. On further inquiry, she gave history of multiple IM injections from the local GP. She also developed difficulty in standing up from sitting position as well, in, as, well as in combing her hairs. In the submammary area, the skin became so weak that the striae gave away and formed lean pulses palatally. These ulcers were painful and were associated with first discharge. Unfortunately, her six months old daughter also acquired her tinea infection and developed similar itchy lesion throughout her body. She was prescribed similar super potent topical steroid in combination with antifungals and started gaining weight and developed increased facial hair growth. She weighed 16 kg at two years of age, which is above the 95th percentile. Later on, her daughter developed watery diarrhea and vomiting and was admitted in a tertiary care hospital where she was given IV, IV fluids and antibiotics. After an illness of only three days, the daughter passed away. Due to the stress and immense grief of her daughter's loss, the patient also miscarried two weeks back and delivered an IUD baby at seven months of gestation. In her systemic review, she complained of difficulty in standing from sitting position rest of the systemic review was insignificant. Her past medical history and surgical history was insignificant. In her drug history, she gave history of multiple intramuscular, topical, and oral medication from the local doctors. She did not have any allergy history. Her family history was insignificant. She did not have any history of TB or any other chronic illness in the family. In her personal history, apart from the weight gain of around 10 kg in the last two months, her sleep, appetite, and bowel habit all were normal, and she denied any addiction. <laughs> Moving to the physical examination, my patient was a young, obese female of average height, sitting comfortably well-oriented in time, place, and person, with a vital of blood pressure of 140 by 80 millimeter of mercury, pulse of 84 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 16 breaths per minute, and she was afebrile at the time of presentation. In general physical examination, she was mildly pale. The rest of the GP was unremarkable. On cutaneous examination, she had moon fishies with truncal obesity, hirsutism, buffalo hump, and large, violaceous purple striae on the abdomen, bilateral upper and lower limb, and side of her back. There were multiple anodic patches and plaques with erythematous water and central clearing, along with post inflammatory hyperpigmentation present on most of our body parts, including face. Mm -hmm. There were multiple ulcers of variable mm -hmm. sizes noted in bilateral submembrane yeah, present within the stria, along with oozing of pus. Hello. In system examination, her abdominal, respiratory, and cardiovascular examination were all unremarkable. In central nervous system and musculoskeletal examination, her motor examination showed a power of 4 by 5 at shoulder girdle muscles and pelvic girdle muscles. Her Gower sign was positive. Rest of the muscle power and reflexes were normal. No muscle pain and tenderness noticed. She had a GCS of 15 by 5, 15 by 15 with normal mental function, intact sensory and cranial nerve examination, and normal gait. To summarize, my case is of 22-year-old parrot female who presented to our OPD with a two-month history of rapid weight gain and non-healing wound in her submembrane areas bilaterally. She had extensive tinea, corporis infection for the last two years and was taking medical treatment. Apart from the oral and topical antifungal, she was prescribed topical, oral, and intramuscular steroid multiple times. She applied these topicals extensively and excessively to help with her itch. On examination, she had raised blood pressure Cushingoid facies and increased facial hair growth, buffalo hump, and truncal obesity. She had prominent striae over her abdomen, arm, and lower back. Multiple oozing ulcers were present in the submembrane area along the striae. Her Gower sign was positive. So, with this history and examination, we made our impression of Artrogen Cushing syndrome, 
and did lab investigation accordingly. So now moving on to the investigations. In blood complete picture, she had a low hemoglobin of 10.9 mg per deciliter with a normal MCV, TLC, and platelet count. Her ESR was 22 mm in one hour, liver function test, renal function test, and coagulation profile were all within normal limits. Her viral markers were non-reactive. In her cultures report, her pus culture showed growth of methicillin resistant staph aureus sensitive to lenticillate, vancomycin, and candamycin. Her blood seeds showed no growth. Her skin scraping for fungal smear from the annular lesions were positive, showing numerous septate high P. Her tissue fungal culture showed growth of trichophyton mentagrophytes. Now her endocrine worker, her 24-hour urinary cortisol was 34.90 microgram. Her 8 a.m. serum cortisol was 6.6 .6 microgram per deciliter, which was just above the norm, lower limit of the normal range. Her plasma ACTH was 21.4 picogram per ml. Her vitamin D level were significantly low, that is 7.63 nanogram per deciliter. Her TSH level were normal. Her HVOC was 6.3%, which fall in the pre-diabetic range. Now the imaging investigation, her chest X-ray was normal. Her ultrasound abdomen was also normal. So we made our final diagnosis of atrogenic Cushing syndrome with extensive tenia corporis and tenia cruris. Management, she was given injection lenizolate 600 mg IV BD according to her culture and sensitivities along with capsule itraconazole 100 mg BD and quatrimazole cream for local application. Injection vitamin D3 200,000 in the national unit Weekly was given for four weeks along with tablet calcium D1 OD. So fertile dressing was advised for the ulcers. Now I will be sharing some case studies similar to our patient. So this was a cross-sectional study published in Indian Dermatology Online Journal in uh, 2021 about the atrogenic Cushing syndrome in patients with superficial dermatophytosis. This study was conducted on 23 patients and the morning serum cortisol level were measured in all patients. 82.6% had significantly low levels and 17.3% had low values just above the lower limit of the normal range, just like our patient. So the patient with atrogenic Cushing syndrome may present the normal cortisol levels. This is another observational study published in the BMJ in 2020 about the magnitude, characteristics, and consequences of topical steroid misuse in North India. Out of the 723 patients, 29% misused tropical steroids. Almost 58% of the participants perceived their skin condition to be allergic reaction to food, when in fact 70% were tenia, 70% were tenia, 10% scabies, and 9% acne. 80% of the respondents having tenia had tenia incognito, and 97% had extensive lesions. This is a cross-sectional study published in Journal of Nepal Health Research Council in 2021 about the improper use of topical cortical steroids in tenia infection in a tertiary care hospital. A total of 200 patients with tenia infection were included in this study. Among these, 87.5% were using topical cortical steroids. This cross-sectional study was published in the Journal of Sheikh Zayed Medical College, Rahim Yar Khan, in 2017 about the frequency of tenia incognito among the ring work infection health seeking behavior of these patients. Out of the total 170 patients, 40% had tenia and cognitive. So this was all from my side. Now I would like to call Dr. Humaira Talat for further discussion. Assalamu alaikum everyone. First of all, thank you Dr. Sabah for such an elaborative case. The idea that we have brought this common case is in order to highlight the, in order to highlight the side effects or the misuse or the non-judicial use of topical, oral, and injectable steroids, either depot injections or IV injections. That has changed the, the picture of the tenia, and the tenia has become diagnostic dilemma. Not only this, but it has become therapeutic challenge for the clinicians as well. And also, the rate of relapse and recurrence is at the peak. Here, I would like to show the picture of this poor baby, we got the pictures from the father during admission of that patient. This baby succumbed to death only after three days of illness. Here you can appreciate the Cushingoid features on the face. Not only this, you can appreciate the amount of topicals they have applied on the face. 
she went to different hospitals initially to a big tertiary care hospital because of non affordability they went to some other hospital and finally in a, a small hospital at north nazarbar karachi and where on she was on iv fluids and she died all of a sudden we discussed the cause of death with the pediatricians as well they have said they are getting the same cases and the most likely cause is either hypoglycemia or electrolyte imbalance i would like to share some more pictures as we are ge getting such type of cases about two to three cases on each day in our uh, government setup and not only in our government setup but we are getting cases in our private setup as well here you can appreciate picture of a middle aged lady and you can appreciate the cushingoid features along with lesions of tenia on the legs face and the trunk her cortisol was quite low in all these cases it is very difficult or a diagnostic as well as a, as well as therapeutic challenge as we have already discussed if we are giving them steroids because uh, their life is in threaten they they are in adrenal suppression because of iatrogenic cushings if they are going to have a surgery or accident or fever because of adrenal suppression they might succumb to death or if we are giving them steroids then tenia will become more resistant so this is a therapeutic challenge for us i would like to show you picture of this young lady uh you can appreciate the features of cushings along with stria on the abdomen and with active lesions of tenia you can see her serum cortisol 8m cortisol was 0.6, 0 0.6 microgram per dl her serum acth level was undetectable 24 hours urinary cortisol was 1.90 microgram per 24 hours it is too difficult to got all these three tests in a government setup because tests are very costly but in order to establish diagnosis you need to go to the test this is picture of another patient he presented to us with erythroderma again a diagnostic challenge here you cannot clearly appreciate the lesions of tenia while closer view uh, with the closer view you can see few of the lesions on the chest and the legs here is another patient he was brought by his brother because he had difficulty in walking Here you can see lemon on stick appearance with thin out legs, moon faces, and with the lesions of the tenia. I would like to uh, share a little clip of this family, and uh, we will run a video right now. Then we will proceed further. ये किस तरह शुरू हुआ इनको क्या हुआ था? आपने सुई कितने दिन घर से बात लगवाई है तीन साल से है ना तीन साल में लगाए आपने कुछ डॉक्टर लिख के भाई ये ले लो डेढ़ सौ अच्छा अब क्या हालत होती है इनकी अब क्या हालत बताए अभी जो लगाने से ये लाली आ गई चेहरे पे और क्या और और क्या होता है आपको ठीक है उसके अलावा पेट टूटा है आपका और चल पाते हैं आप चल नहीं पा रहे कमजोरी हो जाती है तो जब पखाना करने बैठते हैं तो खाते अच्छा गिर जाते हैं ठीक है बहुत शुक्रिया ये यू कैन सी द पेशेंट वाज गेटिंग दीज इंजेक्शन ऑन एवरी थर्ड डे इट वाज गिविंग अ बेट रिलीफ एंड आफ्टर थ्री डेज दे वर गेटिंग बैक फॉर दीज इंजेक्शन सो दिस इज अलार्मिंग विद दिस आई वुड लाइक टू से देर इज एन अर्जेंट नीड टू टाइट द रेगुलेटरी अथॉरिटीज to control over the manufacturing sale and prescription of topical steroid combinations with antifungals then to teach our gps to stop misuse of oral topical and depo steroids and give proper doses of antifungals how can we bring this into knowledge of gps this can be done by requesting companies to arrange seminars with gps 
Public awareness campaign is very important by advertisement on social media to stop over the counter use of steroids by patients, by quacks, and GPs. This can be done not only for tenure, but overall for all the diseases. But things are still debatable. First of all, use of low potent steroid in patients of tenia infection. We all know that in the beginning, we all were doing this. We were using low potent steroids. But with this, we should call tenia as endemic in our area. With this, do we need to use low potent steroids with in cases of fungal infections? Uh, we have searched data. Most of the data have said that if we are using these steroids, these low potent steroids, then the fungal infections can become worsened. Second, skin scraping should be made available in all the setup, either government or private setup. That is easy because some of the cases are very query in between eczema and tenia. Instead of wasting money of the patient, we should go for this simple bedside technique. Fungal cultures and sensitivity. It is not readily available by all the labs. They are doing, some of the labs are doing cultures only, but they are not telling you sensitivity. They will tell you only the organism, as in our case. They will not tell you sensitivity. You cannot get which drug you have to use in these cases. Then a very important and alarming situation, mutation of squalene epoxidase. This is one of the enzyme in fungal wall. And we all know that fungus act by inhibit uh, that uh, allylamines and tabinafin act by inhibiting this enzyme. But no, due to the mutation of this enzyme, there is the tabinafin has become ineffective. So this is again alarming and we need to do studies on our population as well because the mutation is shown by international studies. Then combination antifungals. Only few of the studies say that in combination antifungals should be used in superficial mycosis. With this endemic situation, if we are giving two drugs and in the market only, we all know that only four drugs, four antifungals are available. If we are giving two antifungals, we are exposing patient to two antifungals at a time. We are making him resistant to two drugs. So this should be again debatable. Then finally, what is the duration of treatment? The guidelines have said Previous was too short. Now it is said two to four weeks for itraconazole, two to three weeks for terbenafine. I think with this, we should uh, make our own, we should sit together and will, I will request my seniors as well. I was, will I, I want to request the GS pad, Dr. Shiraz Ahmed, that we should make our own guidelines. Secondly, a very important and alarming situation is that uh, we try to find out our own data but data is missing. We got only one study on tenia incognito from Pakistan conducted in the year 2017. And since that, that none of the study conducted about the hydrogenic Cushing's in patients of tenia or in patients of psoriasis or in any other case. So that is an alarming situation. We should, uh, we should make our own guidelines. We should, uh, do, we should conduct studies. One of the studies from our department is uh, in pipeline and we are trying to get all the studies done. The labs are very costly and patient cannot afford all the labs. The studies from the, we have added the studies from the India, as you have seen, and from Nepal and uh, also the studies published in BMJ. So at this moment, I think we all should sit together and we should uh, arrange a meeting, for example, after six months, and in that meeting, we should present our own studies. With this, I would like to uh, shift. Um, uh, I would like, to, uh, I would uh, want to request Dr. Nasima Kapadia and all other seniors to please give your comment regarding the, this presentation and regarding their own experience of fungal infections along with itrogenic pushings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omera. Uh, I hope if you can hear my voice. Am I uh, audible? Yes, madam, we can hear you. We can hear you. Um, uh, what, what I emphasize from my, uh, during my service was always the use of combination. I always rejected the combination use of steroid with antifungal. 
I used to send messages and everything and people used to dislike it. Most of my seniors also. And they used to say that, no, it's okay. We used to uh, reduce the inflammation, the itching and this. I anticipated very long time back that any microorganism, if you put it through a test and trial of steroids, then it's going to have some mutation and some resistance. And it's, it's going to create a sort of a, um, uh, quite an, uh, you know, fear for us what to use. And uh, we being facing such a lot of economical crisis, you know, all antifungals, we had grisofulvin, five rupees tablet. Now the minimum cost of a drug per day is 35 to 45 for terbinafine and itraconazole and voriconazole is more expensive. Now people have again doing the same mistake of using voriconazole very frequently. You know, in simple first time, they are using voriconazole when a patient is not given itraconazole or terbinafine or anything. They're assuming that this is going to be a resistant case. So again, the juniors are jumping for their practice that this should just, uh, he should become fine in four weeks. So just start voriconazole. Again, they're doing the same mistake. So, you know, a history, a little bit of examination is important. And you just have to ask few questions. You have to collect the data, what he's been using in the past. A lot many will tell you they're using combination steroids. And this is, I'm very sorry to say, we put all the blame on the GPs. Every day from my very learned colleagues, I get prescription of using from big hospitals. I would not name them because I don't have very many friends and made a lot of... Uh, criticizers during my time by this heavy criticism that you know they are still using you are presenting this case and they are still using combination of uh, steroids with antifungals what to say you are you are facing the dilemma and they are using still every day yesterday i got a case and over there a very uh, renowned dermatologist for the past so many months was using one after the another, hydrazole, spectrazole, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, travacot. All these are very common, betagenic. Why a dermatologist would write down betagenic? They are, why they are not thinking what you are thinking in terms of mutations and drug resistance and everything? Why keep on adding one after another cortisone to these patients? So, you know, it is not only the fault of GPs and the fault of we being the dermatologist. Every day they tell, tell me it, it reduces the inflammation. But look at the patient. They don't, they pass through a lot of economic crisis. They don't come to you again and again. Once you prescribe hydrazole, they are going to use hydrazole for six months. What do you think it's going to happen? It's going to change the picture. And when they go to the doctor, she doesn't, she or he doesn't have the time. So they again make the diagnosis and again uh, do the same error of uh, saying that you have uh, been, you are, it's intertrigo and it's not premia and they don't look at the borders and don't, don't give time. So we have to, your all the points are valid. I'll make it short. The You have to do... <clears throat> There are a lot of FCPS people. They are all learned uh, youngsters. They should uh, uh, go and give uh, seminars, talks on various forums with general practitioners, with dermatologists, with juniors. In each and every forum, you have to use media, papers, everything, whatever are, uh, I'll, I would like the Brooks people also to make, uh, to start some uh, awareness campaign on malls and, you know, on big malls where people are coming every day. And over there, some, uh, some you know, some people should be there to, you know, make some small public announcements and things like that to make them aware of using uh, steroids on their own from the chemist and from the local pharmacy. And second, you know, Homera, you said that regarding the uh, making our own guidelines, uh, this is that, uh, you know, we are having uh, 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 four to 12 weeks of uh, use of anti oral antifungals. 
so one can uh, also use it so thank you very much all these uh, guidelines are there for uh, antifungal use uh, it's up to 12 weeks also always one can go up to now for three months uh, oral antifungals thank you very much thank you dr nasima for uh, such a elaborated talk and i would uh, invite others dr sadia uh, from aga khan if they would like to say anything dr najia dr uh, rabia uh, if they would like to add any comment they can join uh, us assalamualaikum uh, this is dr sadia tabassum and uh, indeed a uh, very important and uh, nice discussion and it was very important points being highlighted in this session of today and i hope we will keep up with this activity in future as well and uh, the need of the r is to you know create awareness against the uh, use of steroids in fungal infections so keep up the good work great work thank you dr sadia anyone else would like to comment uh, assalam alaikum yeah. dr humaira i'm dr najia uh, can you hear me yes i we can hear you yeah so it's a, a very nice case much needed it's the need of time that we should uh, start managing the uh, cases of fungal infections properly uh, it's a very good discussion and um, uh, i would just like to add that in addition to giving them proper medicines uh, it has already been stressed that uh, steroids should always be avoided and i agree with that and uh, proper dosage of oral antifungals and duration i would also like to add that they should be counseled in detail as well because uh, they have to avoid the precipitating factors also and we have to ask about the other family members infected also we have to treat them at the same time as well so that uh, they don't keep reinfecting each other thank you dr nazir there are small factors but they also lead to treatment failures thank you thank you thank you dr nazir uh, dr sadia masood are you there dr rabia dr humaira um, i am dr rabia from jpmc uh, very yes. nice cases indeed uh, the first uh, case was also a very nice very rare case of uh, cutaneous tuberculosis and then drug induced uh, le uh, the second case dyskinia tinia did you have uh, very well chosen this case uh, madam nasima and dr najia has already um, uh, thrown light on uh, has uh, given some comments i would like uh, to uh, extend the comment of dr nasima that don't use uh, voriconazole frequently i have i have also seen the voriconazole given by many uh, even by the gps and uh, probably it is due to the uh, companies which, uh, who go to gps and they, they tell uh, them to give the gp uh, these, please discourage these country, uh, these uh, these uh, companies every dermatologist should ask these companies that don't go to gps and tell them this about this drug uh, i have seen uh, two cases of visual disturbances uh, with voriconazole also so thank you dr humaira this was very well uh, prepared case and uh, need of thank you time. dr rabia yes voriconazole is more frequently used by the gps also that should be avoided by the gps and uh, dr javed is here dr javed would you like to comment anything you can come here assalam alaikum everyone and uh, i'm really congratulate to dr humaira talat and her team for conducting a very informative and the need of our lecture especially the fungus uh since i have joined and elected as a executive member of the pakistan dermatologist my focus was to arrange the uh, teaching programs and the seminars for the gps what i think that the gps are the backbone of the our health system without their education i up keeping them updating about the educate uh, skin as well the other fields it's not possible to come back with these uh, problems now i have seen and you have seen so many cases literally i have seen so many patient who has used uh, top for the one year two years 
and the male developed this try and the, this type of the scar formation on his uh, abdomen. So what I think, what I suggest uh, from this forum that the pet should come forward and arrange the, uh, you know, the CMEs like programs, even with the cooperation of the teaching hospitals, the Dharma departments, they should give some short courses for to teach the, to educate our GPs. Even they uh, issue or they can give the, some certificate to, you know, the, by, by this, they can attend the, uh, our programs without educating uh, the GPs. It's not possible to cover or to combat with these problems because the GPs, you know, they know each and everything and they follow the uh, prescription of the, uh, the consultant. As Madam Nasima Kabadia said, that when a uh, consultant prescribed the voriconazole, they started to prescribe the voriconazole. Even the voriconazole, I think, has become much resistance. And there is still, I've not got any uh, response from the voriconazole. It's very, you know, the very costly drug. So, I, other thing is to not only treat the patient, but also educate the patient. What do we do? OPD is rush. Hai. Even if it's private, we don't give the patient ko time. It happens that the patient doesn't have three days. It's a problem of water, it's a problem of water, it's a problem of water, and it's a problem of water. Without education of the patient, it's not possible you get it from this problem. So I suggest, strongly suggest to pay that our Dharma department of the all hospitals and the, our pharmaceutical companies to come forward and make a program to give to give some lectures or teach the GPs. Inshallah, I also from the paid forum, we can give a, a request. We make a request to the G, uh, our pharmaceutical companies to please now stop the making the uh, you know the products like steroid and antifungal. They should focus on the only simple uh, fungal treatment, fungus treatment. I think this will inshallah ta'ala will reduce the burden on uh, the economy of the country as well as the patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. I would like to, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Shiraz Ahmed, GS Pakistan Association of Dermatology, uh, to share his comments. And, uh, and I invite him what he can do in order to bring the, uh, bring up the change regarding this hydrogenic cushing. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. आवाज आ रही है मेरी जी आपकी आवाज आ रही है ठीक अच्छा अस्सलाम आई रियली कांग्रेचुलेशन टू मैडम मेरा तलत और डूइंग अ वेरी हॉट टॉपिक एंड नाउ वी आर टीजिंग वी आर फेसिंग टुडे इसमें हमारे पास प्रॉब्लम मैम ये आ रहा है कि स्टीरॉइड यूज इतना हो गया है हमारे पास और फार्मास्यूटिकल जितनी भी कंपनीज हैं ये उनके तो आजकल स्टीरॉइड बैक बोन है क्योंकि वो अगर हम उनको मना भी करेंगे ना कि आप स्टीरॉइड ना बनाएं तो वो वो उनकी 50 परसेंट जी ना प्रॉफिट वो कम हो जाएगा तो अगर हम फार्मास्यूटिकल को उसमें नहीं कर सकते लेकिन उसमें उसके लिए हम ये हो सकता है कि वी कैन मेक एन सच प्रोग्राम के जिसमें हम जो हमारे डॉक्टर्स हैं या जो हमारे कंसल्टेंट्स हैं तो उनको हम बोलें कि थोड़ा सा अपना जो इरेशनल यूज ऑफ जो स्टीरॉइड है वो कम कर दें अब उसके लिए तो बेस्ट वे ये होगा क्योंकि असल में देखें ना हमारे पास अभी तक कोई एग्जेक्ट करंटली कोई भी गाइडलाइन नहीं है हाउ टू ट्रीट अ फंगस अ प्रॉपर वे जैसे आप मैंने बताया था मैडम ने कि कोई भी मेडिसिन अभी नहीं दे रहे नई नया मेडिसिन जैसे वोरिकोनाजोल आ गया है तो उसमें पेशेंट को वोरिकोनाजोल से ही स्टार्ट कर रहे हैं और मैं अभी इधर दादू में बैठा हूँ यहाँ पर जीपी ने भी वोरिकोना जो लिखना शुरू कर दिया और मेरे पास बहुत से पेशेंट अभी आना शुरू हो गए हैं जो कि ब्लड विजन के भी उनको हो रहे हैं क्योंकि ये उनको भी अंदाजा नहीं है कि क्या डोज दो रहे हैं कुछ जीपी तो ये वोरिकोना जो तीन तीन चार चार टेबलेट खिला रहे हैं एक पेशेंट को तो एक तो अवेयरनेस उसमें हमारे सेशन करने पड़ेंगे उसके लिए पहले क्या होता है क्योंकि फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनीज अपने जो इम्प्लॉज होते हैं उनके जो पर प्रेशर डालते हैं कि भाई इतनी सेल करके लेकर आओ इतनी सेल करके लेकर आओ हम डॉमेटोलॉजी डेफिनेटली इतनी उनको सेल लिमिटेड देते तो वो उनके लिए ज्यादा फोकस होता है जनरल प्रैक्टिशनर के पास तो जनरल प्रैक्टिशनर वालों के पास जैसे वो जाते हैं तो फिर वो अननेसेसरी यूज भी उनकी टेबलेट होती है इस वजह से हमारे यहाँ रेजिस्टेंस इसका ज्यादा आ रहा है तो 
एज अ पेड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव मैं uh, एक प्लान कर रहा हूं मैं कह रहा हूं कि जो हम हमारे सारे जितने भी हैं लाइक सिंध हुआ बलूचिस्तान हुआ पंजाब हुआ सबसे एक टीम बनाए पांच पांच छह छह लोगों की जो बिल्कुल अच्छे लोगों की टीम बनाए जो एक प्रॉपर गाइडलाइन फॉर द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ चीनिया तो उसके लिए वो एक क्या कर रहे हैं फर्स्ट डोज में क्या करें सेकंड स्टेप में क्या करें बनाए एक फार्मुलेशन बनाए फिर वही हम फार्मुलेशन ऑन द प्लेटफॉर्म ऑफ द पेट वी कैन डिस्ट्रीब्यूट टू द फार्मा इंडस्ट्री तो उसके बाद जैसे वो वो एक कंटिन्यूली गाइडलाइन होगी तो फिर वो जीपीस के पास भी वो पेपर पहुंच जाएगा कि भाई प्रॉपरली डोज फर्स्ट आप लाइन में ये ट्रीटमेंट करें अगर इसमें आप रिजल्ट नहीं मिला तो फिर इसमें सेकेंड इसमें करें तो मेरी पॉइंट होगी कि हम एक इसमें कुछ मैं अपनी कैबिनेट से बात करके एक ऐसी जॉइंट वेंचर एक मीटिंग रखेंगे जिसमें सारे उसमें बुलाएंगे सीनियर सीनियर्स को एक गाइडलाइन बनाएंगे once again thank you for dr mera wonderful uh, refreshing our this uh, cases thank Sir, you so much uh, we are hopeful from you also that you will do something in this regard thank you uh, dr misbah is there he wants to say something uh, hello assalam alaikum can you hear me yes we can hear you uh, dr mera uh, thank you so much for such an elaborative topic currently at isd i am uh, treating patients with persistent fungal uh, diseases and i have identified the rectal from the opd almost the whole branch the uh, points that were highlighted by dr nasima dr sadia uh, dr javed everybody uh, everything stands at point the problem is that uh, there is a lot of issues with compliance affordability as well as a patient not understanding uh, the disease uh, aspect cuz bahut se use is over the counter as well the over the counter khare share to group pe beta genic mil rahi hoti hai so there is also a lot of uh, problem in uh, that domain as well pushing void yes i have seen a lot of patients every third patient is with pushing void uh, iatrogenic pushing void syndrome here cuz itne injectable steroids six six uh, monthly apart they have been given in the localities like urangi town baldia town and all of the referrals mostly from there is with iatrogenic uh, pushing whether it's kids whether it's adults and thirdly yes family is not getting treated only one person in the family would want to get treated the other two doesn't want to get treated they think it's okay itni kharish to nahi hai dermovet se baith jati hai so a lot of understanding and a lot of uh, work needs to be done from the uh, from the dermatologists in order to actually uh, be at a pace in the near future otherwise ek pura wo ek mountain hi climb hota ja raha hai and we don't have a solution uh, out of it because uh, there are a lot of things there are lot of uh, seminars lot of matlab uh, 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 gp awareness programs even i really like the idea of, of the malls uh, malls ke andar dr nasima wala idea bahut acha hai mall awareness because a lot of people jitni ye locality hai jaati hai malls aur ye aur tv ka i don't know if we can have the media a pad can have media on board with it but uh, even i would like if there media on tv we could do something about it i have done a few work probably in the coming uh, weeks we can uh, get that the pamphlets and the uh, book so inshallah we will love to uh, share from the isd uh, platform as well so but thank you so much for uh, such a, a wonderful uh, topic that's now very close to my heart thank you dr misbah for thank such you. a wonderful such wonderful comments Coming. and thank you everyone but uh, i would like to say something about the first case also i think uh, that is behind uh, my case and uh, tuberculosis is very common in our era and we are getting that we are trying to do uh, tb cultures for the last 10 years but positive culture is not seen in most of the time why because we are dealing with posse bacillin and now id department is not willing to treat tuberculosis without positive culture we are trying to debate multiple times with the id department and we are getting these mdr and exia cases not now and misba is here she has treated one of the uh, xdr or mdr i think case when she was here in civil so um, ideally the culture should be sand in normal saline at the time when you are doing the biopsy 
for the fungal culture, for TB cultures, for all. And you must not get another chunk after your diagnosis. PGs should be clear cut about their differential. They should not make more than three differentials and they should send the culture of TB at the same time. Though most of the time cultures are negative and to make this thing understand by the ID department is very difficult. Continuously, we are trying to uh, discuss the thing with the ID department of our hospital uh, and with the ID department of SIUT uh, in order to uh, tell them that if cultures are negative, then how can we label them as MDR or XDRTB? And what should we do if we are getting any case in which there is relapse. The idea of uh, second biopsy in the case of Dr. Farin and Dr. Dr. Atsa was that we were th thinking about uh, any relapse or MDR, XDR, TB. At that time, a uh, uh, few months previously, we did not know where to send these patients. And since long, these patients have been roaming here and there, and finally they are, uh, they are lost to follow up. Now we came to know that we have to send the patients of MDR, XDR, TB to Indus Hospital. So one of our patient, uh, there was no time to discuss that patient also. We sent her to the ID department and they did not agree that this is tuberculosis. Though two to three biopsies were done previously, they got, got their own biopsy done along with the culture. And well, when culture turned out to be negative, they started her own treatment. So this is the case. If you are getting such cases, you have to send them to Indus Hospital. This is one, another message from this forum. With this, I would like to thank uh, thank you all. First of all, my own team, Dr. Farin, Dr. Sabah, Dr. Aksa, and behind this, Dr. Zara and Dr. Naushin, they worked very hard to bring up all these cases. And my own faculty, Dr. Rima, Dr. Maria, Dr. Asma, Dr. Shazi, and Dr. Javed Neiman is here. And my, my PGs, they are always there to help us. And uh, uh, all those who have joined us, and uh, finally, Dr. Shiraz uh, Ahmed for their support. And last but not the least, uh, Mr. Yasin Mubarak and their team. With this, I would like to end. If you have any uh, queries, you can send us in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you.